Um, hello, my name is Nguyen Yuan. Yuan. I'm a postdoc uh, at GDEL. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And I will tell you uh, about the three d microwave optimal chemical. Hello? Hello? Also, do you have a laser pointer? <coughs> yeah, so I will tell you about uh, the 3D microwave optomechanical cavities we've been working on uh, in Delft. So in some sense, we are also studying phonons, but in a slightly different realization from surface acoustic waves. To start with, why are we interested in mechanical systems? We know that quantum mechanics describes the microscopic world, for example, an atom. However, in everyday life, we don't usually experience the quantum effects. For example, a cat is either playing go or asleep and never in a superposition. So we couldn't help but wonder, is quantum mechanics compatible with large, massive structures? And to answer this question, nano or micromechanical resonators are especially interesting candidates because they are uh, orders of magnitude bigger than the size of an atom, but on the other hand, still small enough to be probed with existing experimental techniques developed for quantum measurements. So the platform we have chosen uh, is called Cavity Optomechanics, in which Florian is an expert. So it studies the interaction between cavity light field and a mov movable mirror. So we can envision such a cavity with two mirrors, one of them movable, the light field inside the cavity exerts a uh, radiation pressure uh, on this movable mirror and the mirror motion in return modulates the cavity frequency. In the past decades, uh, there are many uh, optomechanical systems that have been realized. Uh, examples among them are the uh, aluminum drums coupled to coplanar waveguide resonators from NIST and uh, the photonic crystal cavities uh, from Caltech. So at Delft, we have developed uh, an optomechanical cavity system with uh, two highly coherent elements. The first one is a silicon nitride membrane, and the second one is a 3D microwave cavity. So this is a. Mm, So this is a photograph of uh, such a 3D cavity. Okay, so we have even the laser pointer. Oh, oh, okay, okay. blocking. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so this is a uh, photograph of a 3D cavity. It's made of uh, mach two machined aluminum blocks and with an SMA. Uh, connector attached it, uh, to it to couple in microwave fields. So when superconducting, they have uh, very high quality factors, uh, exceeding 10 to the 5. They have been introduced to the qubit community by the Yale group and is now uh, very useful in various quantum systems, as we have seen in uh, Professor Nakamura and Professor Vida's talk yesterday. And this is a uh, scan electron micrograph of a silicon nitride membrane. The big uh, square is the silicon frame, and the small square is the membrane itself. It has a millimeter sight length, so it's literally visible to the naked eye, but it has a very, it's very thin. It has a thickness of 50 nanometers. So these membranes can have a Q uh, that easily exceeds 10 to the 6. To combine the two of them together, we first prepare a sapphire substrate and deposit two aluminum antenna pads on it. We backfill the whole substrate with uh, silicon nitride and etch a window to accommodate the membrane. In the end, we flip the membrane, coat it with a thin <coughs> aluminum film on top of the whole substrate. So this is an image uh, of the membrane window. This transparent square is the silicon nitride membrane, and this slightly reduced square is the aluminum coating. 
the metal underneath uh, is part of the uh, aluminum antenna pads. So the aluminum coating of the silicon nitride membrane forms a capacitor with the underlying aluminum pads. The motion of the membrane modulates this capacitor, and this capacitor modulates the cavity frequency. Uh, uh, that's how we realize the uh, coupling. So we place uh, this assembled uh, device into our dilution refrigerator. It has a base temperature of about 10 millikelvin. So a uh, microwave signal is first attenuated and sent into the cavity. The reflected signal carrying information about the membrane motion is first amplified and then measured with either a network analyzer or a spectrum analyzer. So when, once the sample is cold, we can characterize the cavity response. So here we plot the reflection coefficient as a function of frequency. Uh, so uh, the line width is about 46 kilohertz. Together with a resonant frequency of 5 gigahertz, uh, this corresponds to a loaded quality factor of about 10 to the 5. And it's a few times better than the uh, coplanar waveguide resonators. So the thermal motion of the membrane produces uh, sidebands on either side of the microwave signal. We can send in a microwave signal at the cavity resonance and measure the power spectrum of either one of these sidebands. And from the line width of the Lorentzian, we uh, extract the quality factor as high as 3.5 times 10 to the 7. And for our 123 kilohertz fundamental mode, this corresponds to an amplitude decay time as long as 1.5 minutes. So it at least confirms that this aluminum thin film we deposit on the silicon nitride membrane does not compromise its high quality factor. So uh, now we would like to characterize uh, the coupling between the membrane and the cavity. And we do it via an experiment called uh, the optomechanically induced transparency or OMIT. So we send in two phase-locked microwave tones, a drive tone that is lower than uh, the resonant frequency of the cavity, and a second probe tone that's in the vicinity of the cavity. When the difference between them is exactly one mechanical resonance, we see a sharp um, peak within the broad dip of the cavity resonance. So from this transparency uh, window, we can extract a uh, parameter called the cooperativity. So this transparency is uh, effectively the interference between this probe tone and the mechanical sideband generated by this drive tone. So their beat note is e effectively driving the mechanical resonator. So the cooperativity is essentially a ratio between the square of the optomechanical coupling G0 and the product of the cavity decay rate kappa and the mechanical decay rate gamma m. And it's proportional to the number of driving photons. So cooperativity is a very concise parameter that uh, captures all the most important um, optomechanical uh, features. So, um, the maximum number of cooperativity we achieve with the 3D um, of the mechanical cavity is 1.46 times 10 to the 5. So right now I am claiming that this is a very large number, but what are we comparing it to? It turns out that cooperativity determines the optomechanical system's ability for cooling. So the average phonon occupancy of a mechanical resonator uh, dependent is dependent on the temperature. For 13 millikelvin, uh, the initial occupancy of our 123 kilohertz resonator is about 2,000. To observe any quantum effect, we want this number to be much smaller than one, sometimes called the quantum ground state. But we're already at the base temperature of our refrigerator. So what can we do to cool the resonator further? It turns out that there's a very useful technique called sideband cooling. And the way we do it, do it is we send in photons 
at frequency omega d lower than the cavity frequency by exactly one mechanical resonance. So the photons are Raman scattered. Um, they borrow energy, uh, Raman scattered by uh, the mechanical resonators. So uh, you can think of the photons uh, as borrowing energy from the mechanical resonator and upconvert themselves into the cavity. And during this process, cooling of the mechanical resonator is realized. Um, and the uh, cooling effect uh, can be very concisely uh, written out uh, in this form. So the final occupancy with cooling is just the initial phonon occupancy over cooperativity C plus 1. Now we can put our 10 to the 5 cooperativity into context. It means that our system has the potential to cool beyond the quantum ground state n equals 1. And how do we measure this cooling effect? We send in uh, photons at this detuned frequency omega d lower than the uh, cavity frequency by exactly one mechanical resonance. And then we monitor its uh, power spectrum near the uh, uh, cavity resonance. So as cooling is increased, the peak of the Lorentzian will decrease and its line width will be broadened. The total area under the curve will also be reduced. Uh, and this, <coughs> from the area under the curve, we can extract the, uh, the effective temperature, or in another word, the uh, phonon occupancy. So that's what we did. We increased cooling. At first, um, it traces nicely this theoretical curve. The uh, lowest phonon number we uh, we get is about um, 5, corresponding to a mode temperature of 34 microkelvin. And afterwards, it starts to go up again. So although this system has the potential to cool beyond uh, n equals 1, in reality, we're suffering from the classical sideband noise from our microwave uh, generators. So we have already seen that uh, these silicon nitride membranes have very high Q. And uh, now we're interested in their behavior <coughs> at millikelvin temperatures. Uh, so the Q factor is arguably the key feature of a mechanical resonator. Higher Q means less energy loss. Let's say in the future, if we want to uh, realize a superposition state of the mechanical resonator, one prerequisite is deep ground state cooling. And the cooling ability scales with the uh, quality <coughs> factor. Also, suppose we have prepared such a non-classical state. In, in order to measure it, we need sufficient time before the state decays. Um, and higher Q means longer lifetime. So, so, so high Q is highly desirable. It turns out that we're not the only one who are interested uh, in silicon nitride-based uh, uh, nanomechanical resonators. They come in all sorts of forms. And the membranes we are interested in was first introduced to the, the community of optomechanics by uh, the Harris group at Yale. So they have also measured the temperature dependence of the quality factor down to 300 millikelvin. So nowadays, dilution refrigerator can routinely cool to uh, 10 millikelvin. But in order to incorporate um, a laser setup into a dilution refrigerator, well, the technically, it's very challenging. That's when our device comes in handy, because we use microwave. So uh, how do we measure the mechanical Q? Uh, this is like a very brief review. Ge in general, there are two methods. Uh, you, you can either measure the uh, power spectrum uh, of the um, mechanical resonance. And from its line width, you can extract the spectral Q. Or you can do a mechanical ring down by driving the mechanical resonator externally. And at t, uh, t equals 0, uh, we can turn off the drive and listen to the uh, uh, exponential decay of the uh, mechanical amplitude. And from the decay rate, we can extract the ring down cue. And that's what we do here. Again, we use uh, a two-tone setup to drive the a mechanical resonator effectively. We send in a swap tone that's detuned by 
uh, one omega m from the cavity resonance omega naught, and then we sh send in a second shake tone that's exactly at um, the cavity resonance. So the uh, the beat between these two tones uh, shake the membrane, and then we uh, at t equals zero we turn off this shake tone, and the amplitude of the membrane experience uh, free decay. We can and then we record this time trace with our signal analyzer. From the decay rate, we can extract uh, the ring down Q. Here's the result. We repeat this uh, ring down process many, many times while changing our cryostat temperature. And what we see is that between 300 and 800 millikelvin, uh, the quality factor levels out, which uh, is in agreement uh, with the previous result uh, of the Harris group. But as we cool down below 200 millikelvin, something interesting starts to appear. So the quality factor really starts to shoot up. And uh, it doesn't even saturate at the lowest temperature <coughs> point we achieve at 14 millikelvin, at which point we record um, a uh, quality factor as high as 1.27 times 10 to the 8. We uh, observe similar behavior in different samples, uh, we can see that uh, between 300 and 800 millikelvin, nothing much happens. But once you start to cool beyond uh, 200 millikelvin, uh, Q really starts to improve. Interestingly, this only appears for sufficiently high Q modes. For the slightly lower Q mode, for example here, 10 to the 5, this temperature dependence is not apparent. So it seems to suggest at least there are two kind of loss mechanisms for these membranes. The first one is temperature dependent, and the other one is temperature independent. It might seem trivial, but you have to suppress the temperature independent loss mechanism sufficiently before you can observe this temperature dependence of Q. So uh, with that, I will conclude. And so I, I have shown you that we have developed a new optomechanical system with, three, uh, with, with two very uh, high Q elements, a 3D microwave cavity and a silicon nitride membrane. And uh, the large cooperativity of these uh, 3D optomechanical cavities have enabled us to cool this millimeter-sized membrane close <coughs> to its quantum ground state. And um, these 3D micro cav uh, microwave cavity also allowed us to study the temperature dependence of these uh, very high Q silicon nitride membranes uh, at millikelvin temperatures. And with careful optimization, we believe these uh, optomechanical cavities have good potentials for measurement in the quantum regime as well as hybrid quantum devices. So I would like to thank, uh, thank our group members, uh, led by Professor Gary Steele, this guy here. And uh, this project is funded by FOAM and NVO in the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Are there questions? It's uh, the temperature dependent which is two factors that are fusible in the sense that we observe the same temperature dependence for different samples for the electrons at one sample. Two different samples. Two samples, and we observe exactly the same temperature dependence? Uh, we, we observe this increase of Q below 200 millikelvin for sufficiently high Q modes. Is it exactly the same temperature dependence, or has it, for example, shifted in temperature? Mm. Shifted in what sense? It so as as uh, it starts at the same temperature. So the um, Q you quote, is this the internal Q or the loaded Q? You mean for the cavity? For the it's loaded Q. So, so we have a almost uh, critically coupled cavity here. So, so internal Q is about twice of that. Yeah, but, but I have to commend, for some reason, we have really bad Q for 3D cavities. I mean, it's already better than coplanar, but, but it's really bad compared to other groups' 3D cavities. So, so you have a, a, a very high uh, cooperativity, and, and, and but you couldn't quite use all of that to, yeah. to cool to the ground state, right? So you would benefit if you would go to a smaller 
membrane yes. so that you yes. would have to bring up the frequency even yeah. if you would yeah. lose some QRAM. Right. So, 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 so what are the prospects for that? Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, if you go to 0.5 millimeter by 0.5 millimeter high stress silicon nitride, then you can push the frequency up to one megahertz. And then if you look at the uh, the noise profile of a typical generator, there's really a sharp drop at one megahertz. So you can gain from that. And another way is you design a really good 3D cavity filter that's tunable. So, so we've also looked at that, but it's not, yeah, it's not so easy. Yeah. Do you see any dependence of the Q factor, especially in both in the vibration or gas and non linear effects on that, or something that has not been investigated? You mean the cavity Q or the membrane Q? Uh, you mean, but, but we are lowering, oh, you mean power dependence? Yes, power dependence. Uh, so we haven't done very systematic uh, uh, investigation into that, but I, I agree it will be a uh, very interesting experiment to do. Okay, other questions, yes. Um, many of the mechanics experiments suffered from thermalization issues in recent years. <laughs> they seem to thermalize well down to the person. Well, uh, well, okay, I cannot guarantee that it's exactly 30 millikelvin, but I can guarantee that it's definitely lower than 200 millikelvin because that's the mole temperature. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, we use epoxy, maybe that helps. <laughs> there was another question somewhere. So, <coughs> you mentioned that you suffer from two different <coughs> systems. Right. You don't seem to, so these higher Q modes, they don't have. Uh, I wouldn't say two levels is not there, like Paulo suggested. If you can do a more detailed power dependence, then maybe you can look for two level. Yeah. Yeah. So we choose to present it phenomenologically and and. Very, very, very small, like. Yeah, maybe uh, on the order of millihertz. Uh, for, for a few hundred kilohertz. So there, there is a little bit of frequency shift from run to run, but, but not that much. So one part in a million. Yeah, yeah. Or some other tunneling <laughs> system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which couples to the low Q mode? Which causes the low Q as well? Yeah, so, so. Right, so, so actually, one of the high Q modes that shows temperature dependence and this low Q mode that does not show temperature dependence are almost degenerate in frequencies. So we think, um, so the low Q mode is suffering from clamping loss because we clamp the membrane at one corner and then it breaks the, uh, this degenerate mode into two kinds of symmetries and one is like maybe pulling this diagonal line that's resulting in lower Q. Okay, so with that we thank the speaker again and we reconvene at Q. <laughs>